Today I want to share a message with you. It's kind of a continuation of what I shared with you two weeks ago. If you remember the title of two weeks ago, anyone remember? Yeah, you should. The title of the uh, today's sermon is a hint. Pursuit of Happiness. I borrowed that from a movie, uh, Will Smith's movie of Pursuit of Happiness. Today I want to share with you from Ma- uh, Psalms chapter 90, verse 10 through 12. Psalms chapter 90, verse 10 through 12. Let's all read it together in one voice. Are you ready? Let's begin. Seventy years are given to us all together. Some even live to eighty. But even the best years are filled with pain and trouble. Soon they disappear and we fly away. Who can comprehend the power of your anger? Your wrath is as awesome as the fear you deserve. Teach us to realize the brevity of life so that we may grow in wisdom. You know, in this passage, in the book of Psalm, the author, the writer, gives us a very interesting insight about life and time. The author makes a very accurate statement when he says that that most people usually live to about 70 years of age. And maybe few live to be about 80. And that is still pretty much true today as well. I think those of us who are older, I mean, let me backtrack here. But the author also makes a distinct point of letting the readers know that the length of time Though it might seem long at first, it isn't long at all. In fact, the author states that they will fly away, they will fly by. The time will go pass by really, really fast. There are many of us here who are older, few children, but most of us are maybe older in age. And I think all of us will agree to the statement that time does fly by. Time does truly go by quickly. Two weeks ago, I spoke to all of you about the topic of wasting time. The two points that I made were that, according to the Bible, we are wasting time when we live only to accumulate, to gather wealth. And that we're also wasting time when we do not fully enjoy the life that God's given us. Again, today, I want to share with you something in continuation of what I shared with you two weeks ago about time. Many times in my message, I often mention that in life, everything is about perspective. Everything is about how we look at it. You know, there's a saying in America that one man's trash is another man's treasure. One man's trash is another man's treasure. What does that mean? It means that value is often determined by perspective. Value, what it's worth, how important it is, is often determined not by some extrinsic you know, force, but is oftentimes determined by perspective. One of the main reasons why people waste time is because people take time for granted. We waste time because subconsciously, in the back of our minds, we believe that time is plentiful. We waste time because in the back of our minds, we have this perspective that there will always be more time. In my opinion, that is the number one reason why people waste time. In verse 12, the author states that wisdom, real wisdom, comes when we 
when we truly understand how precious time is. The author says, teach us to realize the brevity, the shortness of life, so that we may grow in wisdom. Really knowing and understanding how precious time is, it says it makes us wiser. It makes us live wiser. And the more you think about that, you realize how true that statement is. The more we understand how valuable time is, the wiser we live in this world. Queen Elizabeth, while on her deathbed, said that she would be willing to give up her entire kingdom if she could just have one more day of life. That she would be willing to give up her entire kingdom if she could just have one more day of life. You see, on her deathbed, she could clearly see she had the proper perspective. She finally saw time in its proper perspective. She knew how valuable it was. And that's why she said, I am willing to give up my entire kingdom if I could just have one more day. See, that's how much we should value time. But people still today live their lives believing that there will always be plenty of time. Years ago, I visited Afghanistan. I mentioned to you that several times. And there's one interesting thing. There's, you know, during our first day at this local village, I experienced something very interesting. We got there and we, you know, we were eating lunch. As usual, uh, the typical menu in Afghanistan was they had some rice and they had some naan. Naan is a bread that they eat in Afghanistan. And for those of you who do not know, this is usually how they eat. They put a, they put a big plate of rice in the middle and they bring like stacks of naan. They just start bring it and they start flinging it. You know, not to the people, but where they, you know, to the cloth that they put in in the middle. And they just throw it and they put it in there. And none is about this big. The bread is about this big. And what they do is they rip it, they take some, and they pass it around. They rip it, they take some, and they pass it around. They eat it. And I think maybe there was about 12 of us. And oftentimes they would put about maybe seven or eight large bread, large nuns in the middle. And we would rip it, take it apart, eat it, and so forth. And by the time the lunch was over, you know, we finished pretty much all the rice. But there were some few scraps of bread, none, left over. You know, some ripped, some, you know, oh, you know, you know, torn apart. And the great thing, I think all the wives here would love it. Do you know how they clean the table in Afghanistan? You know, you don't have to take the plate all one at a time to the kitchen and the sink and so forth. They just take the, the, the cloth that laid in the middle and they just, you know, take the four corners Put them all up and carry it to the kitchen. What an easy way, simple way to clean the, you know, clean up after the meal. So they, would, they did that. And here's the part that really, you know, left an impression on my mind is that during dinner time, you know, again, we were expecting a nice, pretty much same meal, but we were wondering what are they going to serve. And to our surprise, it was the same thing, rice and none. But what really surprised me was that when they were passing out the nun, we noticed that they had kept the scraps, the torn apart leftover bread pieces from lunch, and they were serving that again. Now many of us, when we first saw that, we were a little bit shocked, because in America, we don't do that. In America, if there's a little, you know, big loaf of bread and if many people take chunks and if there's some pieces left over, well, guess what? We throw them away. We realize that in the course of the you know, next several days that that was a very common, uh, common culture for these people that they don't throw their breads away. And the reason being was because I mean, the answer really was very simple. 
You see, for these people in Afghanistan, they knew that food was very scarce. In America, we throw away all these leftovers. Why? Because in our minds, when we see bread, in our minds, we say, you know what? There's plenty of bread. If there are leftovers, let's throw them away. If we want more, guess what? There's plenty at the local grocery store. If we run out, you know what? We can always buy some more bread. There will always be more bread. But you see, for people in Afghanistan, that's not how they saw their bread. To them, bread was their necessity. It was something that they needed to live and to survive. And to them, it could be any day. It could be one week or two weeks or maybe two months. They could actually run out of bread. See, they knew that bread was not something that they should take, you know, they should take for granted. It could run out any time. And maybe because of it, they might even die. You see, this is how we should see and approach and perceive time. Too often we approach time like Americans or typical Koreans living here. We always think there's always going to be more time. You know what, today I think I'm just going to do nothing. You know, today I'm just going to, you know, stay mad and I'm going to stay angry. Today, you know what, I'm not going to do any work. You know, today I'm not going to read the Bible. I'm not going to pray. Well, you know, because, okay, after a few days, okay, maybe I'll change my mind. Because there will always be plenty of time. But the way we should be approaching The way we should be approaching should be that of those people in Afghanistan. That you never know when you're going to run out. And you should never take it for granted. So how can we change our perspective about time? How can we change our perspective about time? Instead of waiting you know, for our deathbed to fully realize how valuable our time is, how can we truly change our perspective today, right here, right now? Let me start that process by telling you a, a really a, a, a nice story that I, that I saw the other day. Let's just pretend that a lawyer came by to visit you just the other day. A lawyer. And the lawyer came with a, a bad news and a good news. A bad news is that one of your relatives passed away, died. But the good news was your relative was a rich, a rich person and left you a lot of money. Okay? A lot of money. In fact, the exact amount was your rich relative left you 8,600, I'm sorry, $86,400. Man, that's, that's about what I, you know, make in about three years, you know. A relative left you 86000 Dr. Halliguri, what are you going to do with $86,400? You're going to take me out to eat first of all, right? First thing you're going to do is take me out to eat. No, no, no. <laughs> the lawyer said that your relative left you $86,400. But here's a catch. There's two conditions. One, that you will receive that amount, exact amount, every single day. You're going to receive $86,400 today, and you're going to receive $86,400 tomorrow, and every day. But thing is, it will stop. That amount will stop coming someday. You just will not know when. And the second condition, each day when the lawyer gives us $86,400, we have to spend it all that day. And whatever we don't spend, guess what? We don't get it back. So if we get $86,400, but we only spend $2,000, 
Why? Because we were busy working in our lab because we had to finish our PhD. Or because we're busy because we, we had to watch uh, our favorite TV program, Flowers Over Boys. And so we, we were only able to spend $2,000 of that. Or we, were, or we were too busy working out at the gym, and that's why we could only spend $2,000 of that amount. Guess what? You don't get to keep the remaining $84,600. It disappears. You don't get it back. That's the second condition. Well, let me ask you, what would you do in that situation? You, re you receive $86,400 each day, and whatever you don't spend, you lose. Then what are you going to do? Well, I know what I, I would do in that situation. I'll do my best to spend that money. I'll, from the morning, from the very moment I get up, I will do my best to spend that money as quickly as possible. And I'm not going to say, well, you know, today I'm a little tired, so I'm not going to spend that amount of money. Are you kidding me? I'm not going to waste $86,000 because I was watching a television program. I'm not going to watch $86,400. Why? Because, you know, because I had to go exercise and go, oh, like this, like Luke Hoagland does. <laughs> There's no way I would do that. Because I know that if I waste any of that amount of money, I will never get it back. Well, you know, that's exactly the way it is with time. You know, God gives to us each and every day 86,400 seconds to us. And God tells us that, you know, no matter what excuse you might have, if you waste any of those time, that we'll never get it back. You see, we need to live our lives each and every day as if each and every day is a gift to us from God. But too often we live it and we waste it without realizing how valuable time is. Because we think that, you know what, there will always be more time. We always think that there will always be more time until we face death. We are to live each day as if each day is a gift. As most of you know, I am a big sports fan. I know that there's some of you, you are a big cricket fan. Yes. <laughs> and uh, we might play that next week, who knows, during the picnic. Some of you are a big soccer fan. I'm a big basketball fan. I still, even though I, I'm living in Korea, I still, through the power of the internet, I followed my favorite uh, basketball team, Houston Rockets. About a couple of weeks ago, something interesting happened to one of his players. True story. I read it online. A player named Carl Landry is six, six feet nine. I can't even reach six feet nine. <laughs> he's, he's tall. He's a huge young man. One day, he, you know, one day after the game, it was a road game, away game. And he flew, they flew, the whole team flew into Houston, I think around midnight. So, you know, after, you know, the plane landed, he checked his bag, and I think he had some meal. And then he said he and his girlfriend were driving back home through downtown Houston around 2 o'clock in the morning. Again, he's a good guy, really nice guy, a Christian too. And while he was driving, he said this Honda, you know, that was coming from the opposite direction, just swiped him on the side. Probably an accident, but because of that swipe, he swerved and he ended up getting into a wreck, hitting, I think, a fence, running into a fence, and he stopped. You know, it wasn't a severe crash, nobody was hurt. And that car that swiped him, you know, it stopped after a few moments and turned around and came back towards him. And he stopped, and, the, and that car stopped about 10 feet away, according to him, about 10 feet away from him. And after the car came to a stop, he said the two young men came out. So when Carl Landry saw these two young men come out, he also came out. You know, not looking for a fight or confrontation, but just to 
You know, I guess he was thinking that they came back to see if he was okay or not. So he just automatically came out. But he said as soon as he stepped out, he said one of those guys pulled out a gun and fired several shots towards Carl Landry. Obviously, he said he, you know, he said he got he got grazed once and he he took off. And thankfully, even though several shots were fired at him, he said none of them hit him directly. Just one kind of nicked him. Obviously, he was very shaken. And he said two days later, he came back to the practice where their, his teammates were practicing, and the reporter kind of asked him about the experience. And this was basically, you know, his response. He said, you know. I am just really thankful because he said, you know, I should be dead. I should not be living anymore. Because when the guy pulled out a gun, I was only standing 10 feet away, even just like from here to the, where the keyboard is. And he said, you know, I'm a big guy. I'm six feet nine. And that night I was wearing an orange shirt. There's no way he should have missed me with those several shots. He said, I just, I don't know how he missed me. He said, you know what? I should be dead. So for me to even just stand here, he said, I'm just thankful to be here today. And he said, you know what? Today is a gift. And he said, you know, for the rest of my life, you know, I'm thankful. You know, for Carl Landry, I guarantee you, his days... His time from that moment on will never be the same. Because of this experience, it enabled him to fully understand the value of time. How precious time is. And it made him realize that you know what? He should not waste the precious time. I want to share with you some quotes from some cancer patients and cancer survivors. I think most of us know this famous singer, Olivia Newton-John. She said, my, my cancer scare changed my life. I'm grateful for every new healthy day I have. It has helped me prioritize, uh, prioritize my life. Bill Hemmer, you said cancer changes your life. And oftentimes, for the better. Melissa Bank. These are random people. Previously, it has taken you weeks, months, or years to discover the meaning of an experience. Now, it is instantaneous. What is she saying? You know, he said, you know, it doesn't take me a long time to appreciate certain things. All I need is that, is that moment to appreciate it. What they're basically saying is that every day, every minute, and every second is a gift to them. And it is only when we have that perspective we can truly learn to enjoy life and not waste it. And here's one of the greatest lessons, greatest lessons about life we can learn. Learn to enjoy life by learning to not sweat the small stuff. Let me explain. We can learn to enjoy life by learning to not sweat the small stuff. Now what is the meaning of the word sweat? Don't sweat it. Don't sweat the small stuff. It means don't worry about little things. This is a quote from uh, Joel Sieg Siegel. He's a film critic for ABC News. He said this while he had cancer, and sadly, he passed away, I think, a couple of years ago. But while he was alive, while, when he was diagnosed with colon, can colon cancer, this is what he said. He said, what cancer does is this. It forces you to focus, to prioritize, and you learn what's important. I mean, I don't sweat the small stuff. I used to get angry at cab drivers. It's not worth it. And when somebody says you have cancer, you realize it's all 
small stuff. See, if you want to enjoy life, we need to learn how not to sweat the small stuff. That means don't be so concerned and consumed with little things in life. And what Joel Siegel is saying is this, that every, little, every problem that we have, really compared to the matter of life, life and death, they're really all just small stuff. We think they're, they're big stuff, but they're not. We fail a test. Oh my God, the world has come to an end. The world did not come to an end. It's a small stuff. We get up in the morning and maybe our spouse cooked a lousy breakfast and, and we get all worked up and we get angry. And what do we do? We spend the whole day being angry and upset. As if that is a big stuff. See, if we want to truly enjoy life, the time, we shouldn't sweat the small stuff. See, when you really understand how valuable time is, you're not going to waste it by being angry. You're not going to waste it by being angry because breakfast didn't taste good or dinner didn't taste good. Or that while you're driving, you got stuck at almost every single light. What normally takes you 10 minutes, it took you 40 minutes. You're not going to let those things allow you to ruin your whole day, waste your time. Because why? Because really, compared to life, it's a small stuff. You're not going to let the fact that maybe at work, one of your you know, co-workers did something or says something to bother you. If you truly understood how valuable time was, you're not going to spend the whole day dwelling on those things and allowing you to waste it. If you knew how precious time was, you're not going to do it because really, that's a small stuff. You won't let deadlines at work get you all stressed out throughout the day. You're not going to get you're not going to let somebody being rude to you ruin your day. You're going to forget about it. Because time is too valuable, time is too precious for us to waste it on a small stuff. You know the message that I shared with you tonight and the message that I shared with you 2 weeks ago, believe it or not, this message was just really more for me than it was for you. Because I look at my life and I think I'm one of those people that has been wasting his life, his time, sweating on the small stuff. Let me just say that my life the past two weeks has really changed. I don't want to say dramatically, but it has changed in a significant way as far as how I look at things. Now, the past two weeks, if I may say, I've been taking a lot more walks the past two weeks than I've done before. I don't stay in my office the whole day. If the weather is nice, I purposely tell myself to go outside. Because time is too precious for me to just waste it in my office all day. Especially when the weather and the, and the scenery is so beautiful outside. These past two weeks, I've taken a lot more breaks than I normally do. Because time is too precious for me to not to take those breaks and enjoy God's gift. These past two weeks, I tried really, really hard not to worry about church. Not that I don't, I'm not thinking about it, but I don't want to sweat the fact that, you know, we have almost most of TCI's faculty and students, everyone are away. And I know that there's two other praise team members are not here. I worry about those things. But you know what? Time is too precious for me to sweat, worry about those little things. These past two weeks, I try not, I make greater efforts to look at things in a positive way. These past two weeks, I made greater efforts to enjoy life. I made greater efforts to talk about God with my students these past two weeks. These past two weeks, 
I shared with several students about Jesus Christ. Because I realized more these past two weeks how precious and how valuable time is. So I want to use it wisely by using it on something that is important. And I want to use it wisely by not wasting it on little things, by sweating on little things. Why? Because I realize more now the time is too short and time is too valuable to waste. Let's pray.